We're ready? Okay. I will call the May 16th, 2019 Peninsula School District Board of Directors session to study session to order. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have uh, Leslie Harbaugh and uh, Marcia Harris online with us today. So you won't see them, but you'll hear them. <clears throat> okay, are there any changes to the agenda? Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? A second. Okay, it has been moved by David and seconded by Lori to approve the agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, all opposed? The agenda has been approved. Okay. New business, um, we will have Dr. Jarvis, will you please provide us um, with some information on the appointment of elementary school number nine principal? We were uh, commenting earlier <coughs> today that this is, I think, the 93rd day after the <laughs> approval of the bond issue and reflecting on the the work that has been done and, and the speed of things happening. Last uh, month, you, we had the pleasure of appointing the planning principal for school number 10. And uh, as she has already begun the process of figuring out things like names and so we can move away from school number 10. But we also have school number nine and uh, coming along. So it is now my pleasure to ask you to ratify the appointment of a new planning principal for school number nine. This would take effect officially July 1st of this year. So in the case of school number nine, we're not moving the principal and, and giving <coughs> immediate uh, things that would require him to vacate his office. Uh, but it is my pleasure to bring to you someone that you know well, the, the gentleman who has been principal of Discovery Elementary since 2008 and has shepherded that through the, the tough times and uh, through just watching, for example, as I came on board this last fall, <clears throat> as I arrived on August 1st and the portables were delayed, and really getting that next month or two to watch uh, David Brooks at, at work it is truly my pleasure to recommend David to be the planning principal for school number nine. Stephanie gets to throw things at him when she, he reminds her that he's got another year to plan, <laughs> and she doesn't. The two of them will both be situated at the Boys and Gr Girls Club building this uh, summer and fall as part of their planning. So in their spare time, in addition to being the planning, they're also the, the resident administrator for taking care of our kids in this fall in the Boys and Girls Club as we house four of our discovery classes. I couldn't think of a better way when you all asked me to make sure the kids knew that they were cared for and, and, and not just out in an annex than to move their principal over <laughs> and, and, and to, uh, to take care of them so with Stephanie and David uh, share the duties of uh, the Boys and Girls Club and, and this year of planning, and then uh, we have to figure out exactly where David will be a year from now after Stephanie takes his place, the fall of 20, I should say, and takes away his office. Uh, but uh, I, I say that with some jest, but the, the movement to the two planning principals, I deeply thank the board for the opportunity to assign those two, and as we explained, and maybe the, for the benefit of the public, to be able to involve the planning principals at this stage of the building when it's being developed, when it's being thought of, when it's being designed, when, when lines can still be moved on paper instead of saying, here's the building and you have no options, just deal with it, uh, is, is huge. So. Thank you. We have a lot of work to do with uh, school number 10 and school number 9 in the planning. Uh, one of David's charges uh, soon, and I'll be working with him, is the reboundary process and rolling that out so that people know as soon as possible. 
which families and which neighborhoods will be uh, with him at school number nine. And that's just the beginning of uh, a whole lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, David will also have the task of trying to come up with something other than number nine as the name for uh, our new school. So I recommend to the board the ratification of David Brooks as planning principal for school number nine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Is there a motion to approve uh, uh, Mr. David Brooks as the principal of elementary school number nine? Yes, I'll make that motion. And will a, a second? Second. I'll second. Oh, okay. The Is there any discussion prior to the vote? I would just like to take the opportunity to congratulate both of you um, on, this move, on these moves. Um, I've talked to many people out in the community, and while families of Harbor Heights and Discovery are crushed, they couldn't be happier for both of you and know that they put the best two people in those at those schools and so um, thank you on behalf of the board for doing what you're going to be doing um, and uh, mr. Brooks I watched you um, I watched you um, struggle with the overcrowding at discovery and I'm so thrilled to now let you be in this building of number nine and do your wonderful things there so thank you. And you have a guest with you. Would you like to introduce her? Well, I'm just going to ask Tammy, um, who, in terms of that support, um, you know, the principal's only strong to hear. Partner. <laughs> 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 it's a great opportunity. Um, I also just want to um, thank family. Um, the discovery has been a family um, school for a long time. Um, so it's uh, been bittersweet, but um, it kind of sunk in tonight because tonight um, I ran out from welcoming our class of 2032 kindergarten families um, for a parent night. And just thinking that, uh, oh my gosh, it's going to be uh, what we will have set up for them is going to be great. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, appreciate the board and our district staff and our community um, getting that bond passed. Um, I, it is uh, kind of overwhelming to think about the task ahead. And um, uh, so I'm excited to have Stephanie leading the way. Um, I've got a great support team in terms of our elementary principal group, um, couldn't ask for team to work with um, our leadership. I'm just excited about the, the support that I know I have and uh, uh, we will figure it out and um, if I can live up to that. Uh, one, two anecdotal things um, in terms of thinking of a uh, mascot or name. Today I had a first. Um, we actually had a mountain beaver come to our back door. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen one and we had to get, get the large um, furry something. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's related to the marmot, but uh, only found in the Northwest. So. <laughs> they are really, uh, they will take some yeah, trunks. They said that Mr. Brooks grabbed the uh, thing and took it up to the lift. That's his thing, though. <laughs> uh, uh, mountain beavers, I'm not sure, but uh, it will be creative. But <laughs> um, and just, uh, I think, uh, back to coming to Discovery, the crew um, kids uh, gave me some words of advice that I still have on my bulletin board. The picture, and it says, um, from a second grader, it says, um, advice for the principal, um, if second graders are doing something different from the fifth graders, don't yell at them, because um, we're all different. Um, and so just kind of appreciating um, all of our kids and who they are. And uh, I do look forward to being connected to our fifth grade at the club next year. Um, it would be a good transition for me too. And then to know that um, we open um, and we're learning that um, uh, a third or who knows more of our families are from that big harbor north. So um, as we've seen the new families come in, um, I've had families that say, I'll see you in a couple of years. Um, that would be my third, fourth, and fifth that are 
some K-1-2s right now. So it's exciting. Just I appreciate the opportunity. I hope I live up to uh, what we need to do. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, with that, um, it has been moved by Marsha and seconded by David to approve Mr. Brooks, David Brooks, as the principal for elementary school number nine. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion has been approved. Congratulations. Yay. Okay, we are moving on to budget extension capital projects fund. I'd like to ask Ms. Karen Walk uh, Anderson, sorry. Uh, Chief Financial <laughs> Officer to please come to provide some information on this item. It's written down even. If I if I may make uh, one paragraph introduction for Ms. Anderson on, on this business. Last meeting, you had the opportunity to hear that we were going to put $86 million in the bank, that we had participated in the sale of the, the bonds. And uh, now the other half of that is we have to ask your permission to start spending it. So we need a budget extension for the capital projects. And with that, I'll let Ms. Anderson tell you all about it. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Well, you took away my, my first part of why we're doing this. Um, but we did have the passage of the capital measure in February. Um, we did have a bond sale on April 30th, and we will be depositing $85 million into our capital projects fund as bond proceeds um, next Tuesday on May 21st. Um, and with that, uh, we have ramped up. We are. We have a lot of purchase orders in place, and we are starting to spend that money. And so we have some large expenditures that are going to take place over the next few months. And so we need to adjust the budget, um, increase the appropriations amount to accommodate those expenditures through August 31st, 2019. So the I'm numbers sorry, are a little I'm bit. I'm having a hard time hearing with the paper shuffling. Oh, okay. It'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> the um, numbers that are changing are in bold. So you will see that up under the revenues, we're not changing anything regarding impact fees in, at this point. But the biggest change is the other financing sources, and those are the $85 million worth of bond proceeds that will be deposited on May 21st. So we're increasing our revenues, and at the same time we're adjusting our expenditures. We're increasing them to uh, 23406 a little over that. Um, that's to accommodate um, purchase of property um, connected to the Boys and Girls Club. Um, it, is for the site surveys and testing that were that's taking place with the specialists. Um, we've got architects on board. We'll be paying architects. We've got project managers that we're paying. We also have some overlap expenditures from last summer's projects, the portables that came in late. Some of the site work was completed in September, October, so we have some of those expenditures that didn't occur in August, so we are actually having to account for them in this year. So some of that original budget that we had is being absorbed by some of those expenditures. <coughs> and so not all of this is related to the bond, but a lot of it, it is to the projects that, the four school projects at this point. Um, so with that, um, we are now required um, to restrict bond proceeds that have not been spent. So we're recognizing this first sale. We've budgeted. As we spend, we will be spending against those categories. We have to identify if it's impact fees or if it's um, bond proceeds mm -hmm. or if it's un unassigned. And so basically we have to track those expenditures by the category of um, resource that we're spending. And so at the end of the year, we will be accountable and we'll let you know how much of the bond proceeds from the $85 million um, are still left to be spent. Mm -hmm. 
and going into next year when we build next year's budget we will be building that based on what we have available for the bond proceeds and very likely we will anticipate another sale next year um, so that's kind of where we're at um, so basically this is just to inform you give you the information um, you also have in your in your booklets you have the actual F200 which is the state budget um, template that we um, turn into the state we we go through a process where you approve we submit it to um, our regional office they submit it to the state and they all sign off on that budget extension we will ask we will come forward next week at the 23rd board meeting we are required to hold a public hearing and then we will ask you to adopt a resolution 1906 for just for the budget extension and we'll show the increase to the appropriations any questions yeah, um, if, yeah. Um, I was at the uh, bond sale but for the folks that weren't there um, and folks in the room or folks that might be watching can you explain I know the answer I'll make you do it um, where we ended up with the interest why we sold 70 million dollars worth of bond and ended up with 85. on the agenda later to talk oh, about that oh sorry the bond okay. so i will be coming okay. back to talk about okay. the bond sale darn i'm gonna <laughs> say it now <laughs> it's good okay, okay it's good news so it's good news. right now i'm just sharing the budget okay. extension anticipatory set <laughs> <Yeah>. okay <laughs> anything any questions else? marcia I have, a clarifying, I have a clarifying question Yes. Um, and I think I know the answer, but when you talked about um, some of the portable work that we had anticipated for last year will be, uh, it's actually moving into this year because it wasn't done at the end of the last fiscal year. Mm -hmm. The monies for completing those projects <coughs> will not be coming from the bond sale, bond proceeds. No, they will but be, they're impact fees. Right. Expenditures, right. yes. Just wanted that to be said. Correct. Good. Good question. Lori? No? Leslie? I'm good, thanks. Okay. Excellent. David, anything else? No. Okay. No. With that, Karen, thank you for that information, and we will look forward to the public hearing on the 23rd um, and do that okay. approval. And so thank you. Any questions? No. My future question. Oh. All right, the consent agenda. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda prior to the vote? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move. So uh, Lori actually um, moved. Is there a second, Marcia? Second. Okay, yes. great. It's been moved by Lori and seconded by Marcia to approve the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The consent agenda has been approved. Okay, we will move on to the study session and we look forward to the capital projects report um, with uh, uh, presented by Mr. Jeff Green. While Jeff is coming to the, the seat, each month uh, we will be trying to do a capital projects re update uh, at this meeting. So this would be the study session. We don't happen to have a study session in June. We only have one meeting, so that will be combined. But uh, each month we will be doing an update. And in this case, our project management firm, Green Gasaway, is charged with uh, reporting to the board and the community uh, where we are. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Jarvis and members of the board. It's a pleasure to be here again this evening. I'm joined by uh, Patrick Gillespie, facility director, Brian Ho, the architect uh, from TCF Architecture that is doing both Elementary 10 and Evergreen, and Stephanie Stringer, Stringer who's the principal. So all four projects are progressing well. Elementary 9 design is progressing. Now we have a planning principal that we'll be meeting with and incorporating. So we have had a meeting with the city 
on Elementary 9, a pre-app. On Elementary 10, we have a planning principle, and we will be, and we already have had a pre-app with the city on that project as well. Ardendale, our architects have been meeting with our site-based advisory group, and I think those meetings are going well, and we're anticipating on all these projects um, that we'll have our, the massing diagrams and site plans to you in June. And Evergreen, we also have been meeting with our site advisory group, uh, and I think those meetings have been going well. So we anticipate that uh, the three projects that we don't bring to you this evening that we'll bring to you in June with a site massing. The elementary 10 project that we're bringing to you this evening is actually far more refined than what we an anticipated possible. So we, did <laughs> we actually didn't think that we could get so far along so fast. Huge testament, I think, to Brian and the work of his team to move that project forward. So we're very excited about that. And I'm going to abbreviate some of my comments so we can spend more time talking about Elementary 10. I think it's important to know that the due diligence work for the purchase of the Boys and Girls Club <coughs> is, wrap, is wrapping up. There's a few issues that still require some resolution, and we think those can get resolved in the next week. But that purchase agreement will move forward on your agenda um, in, the, in the next few weeks. There will be a project at the Boys and Girls Club this summer to get ready for the fall. So it'll be a small project, which we don't have the scope completed yet, but Patrick? So we're, we're going to be moving the two Harbor Heights preschool classrooms over there that have been displaced because of the portable fire upstairs. And so part of that, there's two great rooms that they'll go into there, so we don't have to do a lot of work there. But the other two, we're going to have to take down a couple offices, um, a goofy wall that doesn't make sense for that. Um, we work uh, closely with Stephanie and um, others on how that will look so that they can have a great opportunity up there. So there will be two spaces that will do uh, some minor stuff. Uh, we'll add a sink to uh, one of the rooms because it will be a preschool room. Um, and then we're also looking at you know some other minor stuff, maybe some carpet in a room or two. Um, and then getting whiteboards up, that kind of stuff, so that we are definitely dialed in for uh, the beginning of school and uh, the end of August as well as getting all the teachers uh, from uh, Purdy Preschool, uh, the Harbor Heights classrooms moved up, uh, three to four classrooms from uh, Discovery moved over, so there's a lot of work in front of us to go. Thank Sorry, you. Maybe I went a little further than you wanted. <laughs> Never. But I'm really excited about this, so. <laughs> so a major emphasis of the last two weeks was developing a district educational specification to guide us in our work. So this was a huge commitment from the administrators and staff of the district to compress a process that normally takes several months into uh, two weeks, maybe. <laughs> it went <clears throat> extremely well, and I can't tell you how, what a great pleasure it was to work with the district staff on this because there was a freshness and openness about what they were trying to achieve. When you know the answer, Sometimes it comes out stale, and because this was a process the district hasn't gone through for a very long time, everybody approached it with an openness of, about what really was in the best interest of the students, and I think came out with a remarkably successful document. So that document isn't quite in final form yet. It may have come to our office today. It probably will be out tomorrow if it didn't come today, and then it'll be shared with all of all of the architects and the principals at the school, so they'll have an idea of the district's intent. There'll be then some modifications that we anticipate from district from staff at individual sites. So the schools will end up providing a consistent experience for the student, but may be represented in slightly different physical manifestations. So the second district-wide comp component is development of design and material standards. 
So we're looking for consistency across all four projects for ease of maintenance and simplicity of construction. And Patrick actually is leading that. So Patrick, if you could keep it a little shorter, maybe. <laughs> 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 so we're working on the standards this month with uh, Calvin, who's uh, one of the partners at Green Gas Away. Um, so we're just working on getting, looking at some schools, bringing consultants, um, and getting diving into what those materials might be that we want to use, what kind of roofing, what kind of boilers, what kind of HVAC, um, and diving deep into that. So that part's getting really exciting and fun, and we'll get a specification put together for that to send to the architects to put together. And, keep moving it forward and Brian keeps pushing really hard on it he wants it all right now but that's exciting because his him and his team's working really hard to move things forward so great thank you short enough uh, better all right <laughs> <laughs> so so on all of the sites what we're, the first big piece to deal with and actually a major concern of the communities is how do we get the buses in the cars on site and a major concern is is actually the queuing required for particularly for the afternoon pickup and so our Ardendale advisory group was was incredibly persuasive by scheduling their meetings during that afternoon <laughs> queue time and demonstrating the problems with actually trying to find a parking space while everybody's trying to do pickup actually even trying to drive onto the site and so it, it was hugely beneficial, I think, to our architects and certainly to our project managers to understand the scope of the problem. And I think, um, and that's really what we're trying to demonstrate when we bring these projects to you is here's where the building's going to go and here's how we think we can get the afternoon pickup, the buses, and the special event parking all handled on site. TCF has gone well well beyond that, I think, in their conceptualization for elementary school 10. So it's been wonderful having Stephanie available. She's met with us and provided input. She'll continue to meet with us as we get into the interior configuration of the building, which we've just begun. But, and Stephanie, maybe you want to have a comment about the process as you see it initially. Uh, new timer. I've never been through this obviously before, but greatly appreciative of the team, uh, the feedback that they seek, that they hear, and then immediate response to that feedback. Um, I, yes, transportation is a huge thing that we consider at the elementary schools, and what does that look like for parents and buses? And I've just been grateful that we're, we're looking at creative solutions to make sure that um, city guidelines and planning is attended to, but also the needs of the building. Um, I've been very grateful for that. And Brian, would you like to go ahead and uh, tell us the process where you're at and show us basically the massing diagram, site layout that you yeah, anticipate? Yeah, absolutely. So as you know, um, elementary 10, the reason that we're um, moving a little bit faster on that one is because it is planned to open a year earlier. And so we are um, moving as quickly as um, we're able. I keep telling Jeff that we're going to keep trying to move faster than he allows us to, but, you know, we're constantly asking the questions. and. Um, and I, I will say that um, one of the things that we were um, hopeful for is that we would get answers when we asked for them. And between Jeff and his team and Patrick and Stephanie, we have gotten a lot of really good feedback really quickly. So it's allowed us to move pretty quickly. So um, we have, Jeff mentioned, um, about to complete the due diligence, our portion of the due diligence study. So that's um, about, about finished up, uh, uh, getting very close to finishing up the tenant improvement project that's going to happen this summer. So as we're working on the phase two project um, and we're looking at um, how to deal with some of the challenges on that site, the site is relatively small, it has um, some slope to it and um, as Jeff mentioned, parking and uh, bus drop off and parent pickup, those things are all um, a bit of a challenge. So we do have, um, I think you have a copy of the site plan that we um, provided, which is a conceptual site plan. We studied several different options on how to lay out this site. Looked at the building addition, which is about 35,000 square feet in a, a couple different locations. There's not too many options, but um, a couple different locations and a couple different configurations. And um, we didn't really um, 
expect to land where we did, which is on the north side. Well, we expected to land on the north side, but we relocated the main entry to the north side of the building, and that really worked out well because um, as the addition and the existing building come together, that hub or knuckle right there allowed the administration to be more central in the building than it would be if it was um, where it currently is. So as you can see on the, the plan up here, um, after studying several options, that we have um, located the building addition, it's two stories, um, that site slopes down, um, it's a split, kind of split level, two-story building now, it slopes down to the west, so that two-story addition would um, head out toward, to the west towards the track and really stack mostly classrooms, um, although the administration and the library are in that um, addition as well. We haven't yet gotten into the nitty-gritty of the interior floor plan arrangement, and that's one of our next steps. So before, just so make sure everybody could read the plan well, so the whiter part of the building is the existing building, and the slightly gray part of the building is the addition. So the addition's on the right-hand side, which is the north side. The current drop-off is that semicircular um, drive that's on the left-hand side of the building. So that's the current entry to the building. And the proposed new entry to the building is from that looped parking on the right-hand side. Yeah, thank you for that, Jeff. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, north being to the right, what we're showing is two separate parking lots now rather than the one singular looping parking lot that's there now. Mm -hmm. And um, one, of the, one of the key criteria that we always try to achieve and I know is important um, for the district is um, to try to separate bus and parent drop-off mm -hmm. traffic. So what we're showing is the parent drop-off and pickup um, lot being on the north side or to the right of the page near where the new main entry administration would be. And then the bus lane being to the south side or the left hand of the, of the screen there. And so that would allow access from two different points, one being at the front door to the building and one being through um, the gym or the, the commons area. That bus loop would also be able to be used for um, some staff parking, after hours parking, and what we're really trying to do also is maximize some of that parking over there because of the needs at the turf fields during um, other events. I was going to ask, so it, will it that turf field, it's Gig Harbor's turf mm -hmm. field, that will still be accessible from this parking lot. That's correct. Much more easily yeah. than it is currently. <laughs> you yeah, like right the sloping <laughs> hill that you have to go up right. and slide down? Yeah. If you notice right above the trees, there's a nice ramp uh, system <coughs> that uh, we are looking into getting put in there. Oh, good. Yeah. And yes. then, Brian, did I understand you, you are you're flip-flopping the main entry to the, to the north, north side, side yes. of it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so we'll still have an entry on the south side, and what that um, serves um, has yet to be um, determined as we lay out the interior of the building. But the yeah, because what's the functionality <coughs> then of that kind of loopy entryway on the south side? Yeah, and I think as we start to look at what programs go in that side of the building and if there are needs for other uh, okay. secondary entry point that it, um, we might be able to... This is where we're happy to be working with Stephanie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so we'll find the functionality yeah. okay. for that. Um, so with the remaining space on site, um, we are looking to just maximize the amount of field area, playground, um, paid play space that we have. So that's what you see in the, um, the rest of the space between the building addition and the bus loop there and working with our civil engineer to get the grading right so that's actually flat, um, whereas today it is not. So it'll be um, more gently sloping and not uh, steeply sloping like it is today. So um, it'll be uh, some pretty creative work to make all that happen, but uh, we're, we're feeling pretty good about uh, where it's headed right now. And we're also working with the city to try to figure out how to just maximize our parking, meet the requirements, and uh, um, get creative where we need to. Mm -hmm. The gray area here, I'm sorry, I can't read it. Um, mm -hmm. That's to the back of the building then. Is that the playground that area? That would be the that's paved playground. Right. Yep. Okay, is it the dot dashed line is, is a part of the ed specs that's covered play covered area? Play area covered yeah. play area, Didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 sorry, it's, uh, thank you. No, it actually is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so I it's, know. It's, it's not built yet, but <laughs> it might be there. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not... The part, the access points in the parking, we think are going to be similar. The building may, the building addition may swing around, change shape a little bit, and the playground almost certainly will change over the course of the next two months. Um, 
the the addition is two story, just like the current building is, so it will match up to the floor lines of the current building. Right. For Ella, I know that the, a lot of the interior hasn't been mm -hmm. mapped out or whatnot, but in terms of safety for an elementary school, mm -hmm. two story, the exterior, is it what your design is? I mean, that's we're obviously thinking about all of that stuff and the new latest and greatest things to keep our kids and teachers secure. Yes, absolutely. So this building will have an oversized gym, probably. It does right now. <laughs> <laughs> so our, we, this is not a standard gym, and we don't intend to build another gym of the size of the elementary okay. level. Um, and there may be some other pieces of the building that may exist because it, they already exist and we can't reuse them to meet our program. So this may, we're anticipating this building will be several thousand square feet bigger than our standard because, because. of the space that's already created. Okay. So, yeah, and I, we do, we have one other view. I think you have it. Um, any other questions on the site plan before we go to that? Lori? Mm -hmm. uh, Marsha and Leslie? <laughs> We can't hear that what was just said. Oh, just do you have um, any I other questions? The rest of it. Do you have any other questions? What? Brian just asked if you had any other questions on this, on the map or the picture of the school on the, on the next slide. We're gonna, oh. No, we're going to go yeah. now to the massing diagram on the next page. So go ahead and put the next what? slide up. Okay, my one question on, on the, I guess it would, rendering is what you would call it. Um, that I think I sent in yesterday was, um, it wasn't clear to me, north, south, east, and west, in those large windows, what direction were they facing? Or what did they expect to face? The, those windows, so we're, southeast to me. <clears throat> we're looking at the north facade, so we're looking south. So the windows would, would face to the east? No, the, the windows, windows well, those windows are actually I, facing primarily to the north. To say, we're just introducing that view to the public, and <clears> so I, I'm going to ask for just a minute to let uh, Ryan and Jeff sort of introduce this view before we get into too many questions on it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, yeah, the view we're seeing is looking from the north. So we're seeing the north facade and a little bit of the east facade um, on this, this view. So. Um, you might have picked up on Jeff mentioned um, a massing view, and it um, it might look like a little bit more than a massing view to those of um, you who might have seen massing versus renderings before. And um, what we're doing is we're we're studying how we might respond to this building and be compatible with the existing building. We haven't yet finalized any design here, but we are starting to look at um, what the materials might be, what the what the overall size and scale, and and how the entry might feel. We do have more work to do on um, vetting and refining and, um, and designing this building addition, working with Patrick on uh, material standards. But we wanted to give you a view today that uh, kind of gave you a flavor of what it might be, but also just um, the overall size and scale because it is a two-story addition. But it's also starting to be in the, it's in the portion of the site that is starting to slope down to the north. And so it's, um, it's matching the two floors of the building now, where the upper floor in this is the is the, the main floor as you come in the main entry now, the lower floor matches where the gym is. So we're showing a more significant entry um, element right here, which would have um, the main entry component, vestibule, um, administration, so there is uh, visibility out to the parking lot of the entry. Um, I mentioned security before, so we definitely wanna um, have views out, which the existing administration location doesn't really have great views out to the entry to the site. And then the classroom wing heading off um, to the right side of the page here um, and really picking up on a lot of the architectural um, components of the existing building. So just to orient you, and Marcia, if you're watching on streaming, maybe this will make sense to you. I'm not watching on streaming. Um, <laughs> so, I'm San Antonio, and anyway, it is where it is. So this is the existing building, and this is an east facade. So this piece of glass doesn't go into any rooms, it goes into a stairwell. And, but that's facing towards Highway 16. And then this facade, including all of this, is north facing facade. So. Marsha, where it says elementary number 10 in red. 
Mm -hmm. That's the east facing facade that he was just speaking of. I, I understand. That's the window facade, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah for how? Yeah. Around yeah. the corner. Yes, yeah, so, right. And that's into. So, uh, am I understanding, and I don't have it in front of me right at the moment um, because we just got in, but is um, will the main entry be on the first level or actually what appears, the, or the second level, which is the main level currently? The main entry will be on the lower level, and so administration will be on the lower level, and there'll be a, a okay. primary stair that takes you from that lobby up to the um, second level and, and connects the two. Okay. Thank you. So Brian brought a virtual, <laughs> a virtual reality toy, which uh, you can put on and turn around. It's pretty fun. It can't actually walk through the building, I don't it's think. Yeah. yeah. If you, if you but you, time. you can see what it would be like to stand at the entry and look. You guys want to come over here, or is it better if you can? Um, or no, I it think, may take too much maybe, time. Yeah. It, well, and, and then we've got two that won't be able to see it. So. Oh, right. Um, it looks, you David, would you like to go see it, it, do it on behalf of the board for us? It's not my fault. Why don't you view it? Why don't you view it? we do it next week? David's going to view yeah, it so just on, on behalf of us so we can hear the oohs and ahs. And we'll do it, yeah. We can do both. So we'll make it, Brian will make it available at your convenience. So if we know when you are available to take a look at it, he'll make it available. You have to get a point? Oh, is it not John? No, it's there. It's just, yeah, you can just just uh, look around. Turn, turn your head back. Turn, oh, look around. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. you, you're, 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 you're in charge. So you can look up. Okay. Yes. How do you go in? Yes. yes. You can't go in. Yeah. I want to go in. This way. Uh, say that again. I thought we were say that again, Leslie. Okay. There, I know there's some technology out there where you can put it on a scan code and then use your, you can scan it with your phone and then look at it that way, almost like virtual reality. So, so that would be a really good way if they have that technology. We do. We can, okay. we can do that as well. And we'll yeah. so, so we'll, thank you. We'll look at that for future. All right. Good. That concludes our report unless you have questions. Any questions from the board? David, Leslie, Marsha? Looking forward to next week. Okay. Yes. Leslie, did you have one? I just said it looks great. Oh. I'm very excited. Yeah. Uh, we, we, have, we are Thank very you. excited too where, where we're at. And, great work. Uh, we're very happy with TC up right now. Great work. Thank you. <laughs> right now. Freudian <laughs> 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 slip. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you. Sure. Thank you for being succinct. Okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, now we will ask. Karen Anderson to come up and talk about the bond sale. I don't have any questions. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go over um, the results of the bond sale. We did share a, a more broad, in-depth report to the audit committee, the audit and finance advisory committee um, on Monday. Uh, I believe it was this week. Mm -hmm. Was it this week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, from that presentation, I took some select slides. Um, we will post the whole thing on the website um, under the facilities. Um, but for right now, I just wanted to give you the results. Um, basically, we did sell $85 million worth of bonds, and the proceeds will be um, deposited into the Capital Projects Fund on Tuesday, May 21st. Um, the sale went really well. Um, the, uh, we, basically, we wanted to minimize the interest uh, rate risk. Um, and we were able to lock in interest rates at a substantial portion of the bond um, authorization, so $85 million worth of the 198. Um, we got a really good um, interest rate. Um, with our strong um, ratings, uh, we were 
people wanted to buy our bonds, which was good. Um, we uh, had we wanted to get an aggregate true interest cost that didn't exceed 5.5 percent, and we actually came in at 2.94 percent. So we did really well there, um, and we are able to. Um, still have some flexibility in the future that if we want to do two more sales or one more sale, we still have that option. Um, so we haven't really locked ourselves in. We've built a, a payment schedule that will allow us to sell bonds again in a year. Um, and we still can, based on what's happening with the market and the interest rates, we can make the decision closer to that time as to whether or not we want to do one sale or two sales. Um, we are staying true to our 79 cent um, rate per thousand dollars of assessed value um, and that's based we're estimating right now um, an increase to assessed value of six percent there's a very good chance that it will be under um, the 79 cents per thousand of dollars of assessed value mainly because it assessed value will go up higher and that will drive the rate down mm -hmm. um, so let's click through that um, this is a very small print um, but again we still have some flexibilities with hundred and thirteen million dollars worth of bonds still to sell um, we are able to make decisions in the future based on what's happening with the market and um, what our needs are, that we could structure one sale or we could have two, two more sales in the future. Um, it just depends on what's happening at that time. Um, and then the highlight that I wanted to show was this is the graphic that we um, got to see that basically um, we had more we had more interest in bonds and people wanting to buy our bonds than we had bonds available to sell. And um, so it was really a positive um, experience. Um, I, it was the first time I'd sold bonds and so it was, it was um, rather interesting at how quickly it went. Um, within 40 minutes, pretty much everything was pretty much sold and within an hour we were wrapping things up and everything was done. So um, David was present. Um, Art and I went up to Piper Jaffrey and um, just kind of watched the blue, the blue marks going up. <laughs> and um, that's, you know, positive experience. Um, good, good uh, results. Um, we may have to look at, um, based on the interest rates. Um, we're very close to, um, we're going to make a lot of interest. And so, you know, we're going to have to work on that as far as arbitrage, but um, I don't see a problem with that. We're on top of that. So um, we're going to be spending it just as fast. So mm -hmm. okay. any questions? Mm -hmm. David, Laurie, yeah. Marsha, Leslie, any questions? No, I heard it Monday night, so like you, so. Yeah. I think it, fine, it's you. well done. I think we should be proud of, of um, the district's bond rating and the financial stability that made this all happen with such good results. And Karen, I just like, because I like to hear it, that can you tell us about the local person that bought bonds? Oh, we did have a local, um, we did have a local, um, individual that was interested in um, purchasing our bonds and um, we put that, that person in touch with Piper Jaffrey and they, um, they introduced that person to someone else that could help them purchase the bonds and we were actually able to go in and see, um, you can actually go in and see who buys and there's, if you look at the first year um, of the blue bars, you'll see a little green, there's a little green. Anytime there's green, it means that it's an individual investor and um, that individual, um, we could tell that that individual had participated and had purchased bonds. So pretty exciting. Yeah. I'm, 
I think there were a few, yeah. not just that one, but okay. there were several individuals that um, purchased bonds. So. Yeah. I thought it was sort of like an orchestra because we were at the table when it first came on. Some of the bonds, they wanted more than we had. Some of them were, were empty. And then they started to fill up and you had the guy in the back room working the phones, mm -hmm. trying to convince people that had bought bonds that we had too many of them to maybe move into another column. Mm -hmm. So little by little, they just filled in all the blanks. And so mm -hmm. it was pretty, pretty there cool was, to watch it. Yeah, there was one year where nobody showed any interest in the bonds yes. that were being offered. Um, 2037, I, I don't know, it's going to be a bad year, I don't know, <laughs> but um, they were able to, towards the end, they were able to just take the bonds from that year and distribute them to the other years and people snatched them up because mm -hmm. as you can see, anything over the black bars are um, requests mm -hmm. for bonds uh, and um, the, you know, basically what we had available was up to the black bar, yeah. so. And we went in to sell 70 million and we ended up with 85. No, we, people, we sold 85, yeah. but we sold $14 million worth of premium. Premium, mm -hmm. well, that's what I was so, gonna say, is yes. we got premium of 14, because yes. people were paying more for them than they were actually worth, yeah. so. Our, that was cool. You've seen this happen before, as bond, as bond sales. Would you say it was a typical, typical experience, or? What I think I noticed most as a superintendent is I've sat there holding my breath for a couple hours in previous sales to to really see the bonds go well and find a good climate and just meet our expectations. This one was almost heavenly. It, it, hmm. I don't mean to under, understate the difficulty that they went through, but uh, the reality was it they, they sold well, the district was viewed well, we came out with interest rates lower than we expected. We not only met our own uh, goals, but we we exceeded those. And uh, the the 85 versus 70 is an explanation where they wanted the bonds enough that they would pay a premium for them. And it was it was just a terrific experience. I I keep pinching myself, but it's a it's just the way you plan it. And sure enough, it it did what it was supposed to and even better, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I'm gonna ask Ms. Erin O'Neill will to present the CTE report. Hi, Erin. Good, how are you? Exciting stuff. Isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah. very much so. And current tech education is very exciting as well. <laughs> So thanks for having me here tonight. Um, I'm always excited, as you all know, to share news about Current Tech Education. Um, and also, it is a state requirement that we present to the board where we're at every year. So thanks for having me this evening. So you've probably seen this somewhere that uh, the whole goal of Current Tech Education here is that every student, and there's lots of um, philosophy behind this, but that every single one of our students walk across the stage having aspirations and then a plan to get there. And if we have students for 13 years, we should be able to do a pretty good job at that. Some things that worry me and that inspire that is our country is $1.6 trillion in student debt. That has doubled since 2009. So when we look at um, not only options after high school, how can we give our students the experiences, uh, the career-connected learning, industry certifications, aligned college credit, again, before they walk across the stage. Mm -hmm. So that's part of um, the idea behind our programming. And we certainly have work to do. We've built um, some really great programming in the past few years, but we also have work to do on getting down to the elementary and uh, sixth grade middle school to foster that even more. Even though funding only comes for grades 7 through 12, it doesn't mean we don't play <laughs> K through 6. So. so what you're going to hear about tonight is really based on um, our five-year plan. Every five years, Perkins is, uh, the federal Perkins funding is updated, and during that fifth year before it is renewed, we have to um, submit a five-year plan for our role in 
Current Tech Education. So there are seven things that we're going to talk about tonight that our goals are aligned with. And you will also see that as much as we could, we align them with our district board goals. So curriculum standards and framework. One of the things that I'm um, pretty excited about that's accomplished that I never want to do again is all of our <laughs> career and tech frameworks are updated to industry standards. Some of them had been um, submitted to OSPI and just because of their process, they were really antiquated. So um, this summer and fall, we spent time doing that for all 55 of our classes. They are updated, so that feels really good. And I also learned along the way, you know, as an, uh, somebody that knows education well, I don't necessarily know all of the current tech classes that I support very well. How could you possibly do that? And so just learning more in that fashion was really a learning tool. And like I said earlier, I never want to do that again. <laughs> so I will try to avoid that. But that's really good news. Um, as, as far as career and tech programming, as much as we can, we want to align it with industry certification as well as college credit. I'm also really proud to say this last year that we have worked with our uh, community college partners and we have doubled the amount of college credit available to students who take career and life classes. In addition to that, our partners um, reassess the expectations of students earning college credit. So historically, it has been that teachers cover 100% of the competencies and students earn a B or better. And they are, you might say lowering the bar, but probably aligning the bar with the college level students, that the competencies that need to be covered are 80% and students who earn a C or better have access to that college credit. And again, it's not really lowering the bar, but if I was a college student in that class and got a C, I'd earn credit. So it's more aligning what they do with um, uh, the older uh, students that are in their classes. And then finally, academic articulation. Um, we haven't increased that a lot this year. We have some work to do, but one of the things I'm really proud of is our skilled trades pre-apprenticeship. Um, Two goals with that is how can we align PE, because those students are physically active 90% of the time, and um, intentional about physical activity 30 minutes that align with the expectations that students need to get into the apprenticeships. And so we're going to work on that. But what I am really excited about is third year of math. Students can now earn credit in mm -hmm. that. And we had some really healthy conversation about um, the expectations of the um, State Board of Education and what a third year of math is and what rigor really means and what's happening in that class. And so while the standards are high middle school, low high school, the automaticity needed to be successful in knowing math in the construction fields is critical. It could cost a company thousands. And I really credit, or millions even, <laughs> I really credit our industry partners for arguing for that. So that's exciting. Um, we are calling it technical math for the trades, and that's really intentional as well. The college level math that we could potentially articulate eventually um, is technical math, so that was intentional. With regarding technology, materials, and equipment aligning with the board um, goal of effective resource management, <coughs> Uh, in our five-year plan, we looked at um, the fact that OSPI every five years has us go through a cycle that certain pathways are up for reapproval. So we just uh, didn't want to reinvent the wheel, and we are aligning, updating all of our resources and materials with that reapproval cycle. This year we did family and consumer science. Um, I think on your board meeting next week, you're going to see health curriculum coming your way. Um, and that was, uh, that was, just really robust and it is online curriculum to align with our district work of uh, the one to one. So that's pretty exciting too. It's one of the few, I think, online curriculums that we all have. We're also putting an investment in Key Peninsula Middle School. As you may recall, a couple of years ago, the intro to manufacturing in, uh, instructor retired and we didn't replace it because frankly, we didn't find a high quality person to come in and do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jerry Gable and I have worked really hard on trying to find high quality and I'm hoping we found that person today. <laughs> um, that's all I can say about that. Um, but that said, <laughs> that said, the lab has stayed empty for a couple of years and so it does need some updating and work. So we've held some resources back to make sure that not only kids have access to high quality 
resources, but that the instructor that we bring in feels valued and cared for, and that he or she has the right resources that are available. The, the woodshop tables are 30 years old, Dan, maybe? <laughs> and every student that has sat on them have left their mark. <laughs> uh, so that's one piece of investment as well as equipment. But we're excited to do that. We're excited to bring it back. Um, we will have four of our current middle school classes added then to KPMS. But one of the other critical components is our skilled trace for apprenticeship has been very, very successful at Peninsula High School, and Key Peninsula is a great feeder. While that program serves students from across the district, you know, serving Peninsula students, um, since the lab is right there, is certainly one of our goal, goals. And then also, um, we have looked at how, to we, how do we build um, non-traditional participation in certain career and tech, and so, when we think of skilled trades, one of our goals has been to increase the female population. After our second year, we have not had any females in the program, and I'm also proud to say we have seven females signed up for the class next okay. year. So, Excellent. win there too. But starting that at the middle school is really critical to um, not only exposing the kids, but letting them see that they, they too, young females too, can be really, really great at this. Um, there's a little bit of an impact on our resources with regard to one-to-one. -one. Um, reached out to technology in helping us find resources that may cost thousands of dollars on a regular computer. What open software is out there that maybe we can replace and use our resources a little bit better. And then we have also replaced a middle school lab every year. And so how can we um, reduce the number of labs because computer labs are quite expensive. And instead of replacing them at the middle school, after a couple years, we can use high school funding, not high school funding, but the high school resources, move them down to the middle school lab, and that leverages our money better. So middle schools might not get new computers, but again, we're also trying to use the Chromebooks to a much greater degree, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Professional development. Um, uh, we have a couple of goals that I'm pretty passionate about. One is our classroom teachers in current tech are really wonderful. And I also think a gap that we need to work on is getting them out into the field and working with our industry partners, seeing what the workplace is like and bringing those experiences back. I also think it's a critical part of our onboarding, especially new teachers, but also our veteran teachers, is, is getting them into each other's classroom. So by 2020, 100% of our CTE teachers will have visited at least two industry-related uh, places and worked with those people, as well as getting into each other's classroom and just building relationships, but also seeing, for example, what high school um, students do once they leave middle school, and then, of course, vice versa. Mm -hmm. Our professional development this year has mostly focused on, for lack of a way to better put it, compliance, but I am also um, have ensured that our teachers that compliance is really going to be done through um, collaboration online or through emails, and we can't spend our precious time doing that sort of thing from here forward. So we just met um, yesterday with not only our CTE teachers, our general advisory and community partners, but our main focus next year is going to be about building relationships, not only from teachers to students, teachers to colleagues, teachers to industry partners. How can I assist that by also building up our industry partners mm -hmm. that help support our kids? Then lastly, with professional development, um, I hear it over and over again is, oh my gosh, I've never heard of this program or that program. Where do I find out more information? And I think we often rely on our counselors to be the one, uh, one group of people that helps communicate that. And so um, another priority is that next year we take our counselors on a tour, per se, of career and tech classes to visit with the kids, find out what they're doing in those classes and what their outcomes can be. Teacher certification in, I would say, Washington's desire to be really flexible with certifying people, they've also made it very complicated. Um, one of the ways a teacher can be certified in career and tech is conditionally, which is initiated by the district. Uh, and so along with that, they have some things that they, teachers have some things that they have to do. For example, a CTE training plan, they now have to participate in clock hours. Um, 
And the ultimate goal is that our current tech teachers have 6,000 hours in the field as well as they have participated in a CTE college program that helped them become certified. Hello. So, uh, Leslie, you're still, can you not hear? I'm not hear you. you. No, and Erin, she just kind of dropped out and I wasn't sure if I was still connected. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. Yay. Okay. And, and can you guys mute, mute, mute your phones because it will be easier for us to hear as well. Thank you. So quite a few of our teachers are conditionally certified and we ultimately want them to be initially CTE certified. That's just moving along the um, spectrum of certifications. And so 100% uh, of our conditionally certified teachers uh, have their training plan in place, which is exciting. For the first time ever, we hosted one of the courses, college courses that they need to become certified here in our district. That was very successful, so we'll probably dive into that deeper and continue to do that to support those teachers. And uh, three of our previously conditionally certified teachers are now on their initial. That's a big win. <laughs> so uh, we appreciate moving them over. Um, and then we're also putting some things in place, processes in place. So for example, our district has 55 career and tech teachers. So many of them teach many other things and then maybe one or two sections of CTE. So that's another thing that makes it a little bit, um, a little bit complicated. But we're defining our processes better so that a student that comes in with a teaching certificate and this is CTE is less than half of their schedule, we're not going to require them to also become CTE certified because that's not a good use of their time if they've already gone through a teacher preparation program. However, we will support them through professional development that is CTE related. Okay. Student leadership. So um, Washington State requires all career and tech classes to be aligned with what's called CTSOs or student, um, sorry, career and tech student leadership organizations. So FFA, you might know about DECA. Um, Future Farmer, I guess I already said that, uh, TSA, Technology Students Association, you get the idea. And we haven't been 100% of that um, historically, and now I'm really proud to say that all four of our middle schools, all of our high schools have aligned CTSOs with all of our current tech programming. So all I did was encourage teachers, but we have a large group of teachers who just jumped off the bridge with learning about what these are what they need to do, how Robert's rule of, rules of order <laughs> plays a role in that, electing officers, competitions. Um, we have about six teachers who participated in competitions for the first time this year, and that is a great start. But being um, not only in compliance, because that's not very inspirational, but having passionate teachers that are working with these kids for hours after school, sometimes on the weekends, to really give them that enriched experience has been critical. So that's exciting. Facilities and safety, a um, couple things regarding that. We talked about uh, KPMS and bringing that uh, a little more into the 20th century. Um, but also the main, there are two main um, things that we're accomplishing with this. One is all of our manufacturing labs will be safety inspected every year. All the equipment will be appropriately fixed as needed. Um, this year we've had a gentleman come in and he found things with regard to electrical blades, little things like that, that could be a safety issue. So that'll be a non-negotiable moving forward that we'll have that done every year. And then our foods instructors reached out to me and said, could we have professional cleaning in our classrooms when we think about the food and the degree that um, custodians can clean, but really the sanitation piece. So we'll be doing that uh, twice a year, starting this year, moving forward as well. Advisories and community involvement. So another characteristic of high quality CTE programs is that each pathway has an advisory of community and industry partners that align with that work. This is something else we've worked really hard on and I'm really proud of our general advisory that meets once a month, the first Friday of every month. They help with the 30,000 foot view of current tech in our district. 
They also um, assist with the requirements of having, for example, all conditionally certified teachers approved to work in our district. They also assist with the reapproval process because we can't continue to offer classes unless our general advisory says yes, we should. Uh, and then also just envisioning on how to make the programming as best as it possibly can be. We also have a really strong trades and manufacturing council, emerging technologies, and health science. Two advisories that we'll need to work on for next year include business, and that aligns with the reapproval program. I'm also excited about just rethinking the business classes that we offer um, because I think there's lots of potential there. And then we also need to build a human services and education advisory. So what do they help with? They, um, this year they've helped with the idea of increasing non-traditional participation in CTE programs. Um, and then our work next year is really gonna focus on developing innovative, high wage, high demand programming. Programming that sets students apart by the time they graduate uh, high school, knowing that a high school diploma really isn't any uh, longer enough. And I think we have some work. I'm really proud that we have so many offerings for our kids but we don't have any pathways that go really deep that set students apart by the time they graduate, especially for those students who perhaps aren't ready or don't want to attend college after. So I think we have some work to do. I'm also really excited about, well, it's a 10-year planned Career Connect Washington, which really isn't CTE, probably should be, but it's a separate entity, that their vision for uh, education in Washington State, and we know things can change too, but their vision is that in 10 years, it's more of a K-10 education with 11 and 12 being um, either starting college, more like the Swiss model, starting college, starting apprenticeship, day-long classes, day-long career-connected experiences um, for students. We don't know what that looks like because they're only on their first year of work. Um, but in the meantime, we're taking those kinds of things. And as you know, when I visited with you before, we've already done that. High-quality CTE programs. We need to look at industry certification. Our skilled trades right now is getting flagger certification. So out here on the street where they're at every day, those folks making 22 bucks an hour, in about six weeks, our students can go out there and do that too. Forklift, scissor lift, um, OSHA 10, CPR, and there are lists of certifications. And it's so glad, I'm so glad that we are a little bit ahead of the game because Perkins 5, which starts in 2020, is going to require that any funding mm. from Perkins has to be classes that do these things, industry certification, dual credit, um, career connected experiences. So we're ahead of the game on that. As I said before, um, I'm just really excited about next year. You know, uh, being um, part of the team of Peninsula School District has been amazing. As you know, I come from Iowa, and so building relationships in such a tight knit community has, has taken a little time. But what is amazing is that people show up and they want to help and they want to participate. And I think one of the best ways I can serve our students and our teachers is to continue to build those relationships that make good things happen for kids. Thank you. What kinds of questions do you have? Questions, guys? David? I was just going to say, I don't really have a lot of questions, but just to see how far our program has gone in the six years that I've been on the school board is just I'm really proud of all the work that the school district's done and all the hard work you put into it. And I certainly know um, how passionate you are about it. And so I just am really, really happy to see where we are today versus where we were six years ago. So Thank you. Great job. Lori? Uh, I, would, I would just echo the same sentiment. I, I don't have specific questions, but this is just it was a great presentation, and I really enjoyed um, you know, just seeing exactly what David said, you know, how far we've come and just a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Lori, uh, Leslie. Oh, Erin, I wish you could see how happy I am right now. This <laughs> is a really beautiful presentation. Um, I just loved every minute of it. I almost didn't want it to end. Um, I can go on more. <laughs> I tried to be succinct. <laughs> I, I love that the counselor turned CT classes. It's one of those moments where you think, God, that's such a great idea. Why didn't we think of that before? I mean, it's just so brilliant. 
Um, I really appreciate, especially the fact um, that you're really looking um, at the whole program with that equity and, and inclusiveness. And I have a great appreciation for that, really identifying the females that were missing, that we see have all this excitement uh, in middle school uh, when they go to Cape, uh, but not really seeing that representation um, in the classroom. So I love the fact that you're kind of identifying that and, and really um, trying to grow that. Um, I think that's amazing um, because representation matters. You know, all kids yes. need to know from whatever walk of life that, that they can do uh, whatever they wish and have the opportunity to do so. Um, I am curious about, we go back here, to, went too far, sorry. It was the student leadership. <coughs> student leadership piece? Uh, oh, mm -hmm. The student leadership slide, mm -hmm. which I think all of these clubs uh, and organizations mm -hmm. are truly wonderful. Um, I, I'm really only um, familiar with the, the TSA. Um, that really kind of thinking about sometimes um, they can be expensive and making sure that um, we're kind of sort of keeping an eye on that to make sure all kids who want to participate can and have the ability to do so. Um, and making sure again that we have that representation that you've been working so hard for. I really thank you for that. That really makes me just so incredibly happy. Yay, well we, um, we have addressed a little bit of that. One of the barriers is the participation of just membership. And um, with details I'll leave out, I just kept challenging the fact that CTE funding couldn't pay for that or that's what people kept saying. The bottom line is it can. And so we have paid for 100% of our student memberships this year. Okay. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Great job. yeah, there are things we can't pay for like travel and, and uh, competition entrance, but that's where the whole organization comes in and that they can participate and create activities that generate funding. All right, Marcia? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I echo what um, the last two board members have said. I, I think it's amazing the progress that we've made. I did um, have a question when I read through it, um, and that was you were developing comprehensive five-year plans in various areas, is that correct? I mean, there were five um, areas listed in development of programs. Um, trade was one of them, um, maybe the educational component. I don't have it right in front of me. Oh, so, no, you um, bet. I'm happy to share those. So uh, we have the Pathways five-year program on what we're going to focus on each year over the next five years. I didn't include that, yeah, and, and um, my, but I'm happy my to. My question was, <laughs> Um, was understanding the order in which we were taking those on. Yeah. But just that the trades has been um, such a focus for the last two or three years, and it was actually number three on the list. So it was just curiosity. You bet. Well, the pathways are aligned with the reapproval pro process, but all of the pathways, the five, for example, the trades, emerging technology, arts, and communication, each one of those separate pathways has a five-year plan that specifically addresses curriculum, resources, computers, and things like that. And so, again, I'm happy to share with that. So while a particular okay. pathway might not be, so for example, family and consumer science this year, it doesn't mean we're not going to address the needs next year. It's just a way to, again, align resources, especially with the expensive things. Um, KPMS so, we're paying for this year just because it's held dor it's been dormant for two years. Right. Oh, right, and I guess that's really a need. So, okay, thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you, Marcia. Are you and able to keep the pictures of all the kids? You can just save those for historical. Of the tables. Oh, that's a good idea. Maybe Will you store them for me? <laughs> maybe maybe one of them. There you maybe go. Piece of it. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Well, the first thing we're going to do is see if we can turn them over, uh, oh. and if we can't, we'll replace them. <laughs> the there. Thank you, Thank um, you. for the presentation, Erin. I'm actually I'm oh, really quick sorry, you no, no. Um, one, I appreciated the representation of tying the board goals to what you guys mm -hmm. were working on, so I, I thought that was very neat. Thank you for a adding that. And then um, I know I sat in on the meeting when they first started talking about getting more females involved in the program, yes. and there was lots of ideas. 
um, all over the place. And don't have to go into it now, but it'd be interesting to see which of those techniques or strategies were successful. And maybe we can use that in other areas where we're looking to get non um, traditional groups involved in, in mm -hmm. something. So just be I can give you the quick answer. Yeah. I know exactly okay. what it is and what didn't work. Okay. So it was inviting our students to go just like we would uh, college representatives. Uh -huh. So they went, they participated in the obstacle courses that they do, they got to see the lab. Our rock star students hosted them, showed them around, okay. told them what they would be doing. It was the number one effective strategy. I remember that being suggested. Yes. That's great. Good. <laughs> Me going to the classes telling kids about it <laughs> was not <laughs> successful. Peer to peer. Peer to peer. All right. Yeah, that's excellent. <coughs> Thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Okay. We'll move on to Department of Learning and Innovation. Melissa Weisner and Chris Hagel will present. Um, while, while they're coming to the uh, chairs, I'd like to introduce a, a new department. And yes. you don't have enough acronyms, so we're going to try to figure out which one to put, whether it be DLI or whether we talk L and I. Not <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the, the reality is that uh, we have been working all year. Your, your phones are noisy. Yeah. <laughs> We've been working all year to look at, at both where do we want to go and how, do, how are we going to make choices and decisions, how are we going to align ourselves to reflect uh, the directions we're going, and how to do that in the sense of where we're heading in terms of learning. So uh, you are certainly well aware that this year we rolled out the one-to-one -one devices, and that process is still underway. Uh, you may be uh, aware of some of the areas where Melissa and the curriculum department uh, were doing professional development and continuing the efforts. But I think what we're trying to do at this point is to now move into a very consolidated effort. In a few minutes, we're going to be talking about the board meeting schedule and an opportunity to pick up some loose ends on strategic planning, kind of conversations, goals. Uh, and I think what you hear again in just a few minutes from uh, Melissa really sets a stage for how do we do some of the work. You've, you've heard the information. We'll have uh, John Yellowlees talking about the multi-tier as a, as a main effort. But it, I am really very, very proud to present to you uh, people who are now aligning the world of our, uh, our district in a different way in terms of staff and uh, reflecting our, our efforts and priorities. So I am introducing to you our, uh, our learning and innovation department, and I'm asking Melissa Wisner to, to really walk us through what does that mean, and, and is it just a title change or is there something else? So I will withhold some of my pontification here uh, <laughs> and really hand it to the people who are doing the work. Melissa, Great. thank you. Well, thank you for this opportunity to come and start the conversation with you. Um, this is a unique uh, department. We don't think there are many departments um, that have combined teaching and learning or curriculum instruction and assessment with technology, um, but it makes absolute sense to us. And so um, I'm going to have Chris go through the, um, I guess it's our org chart, but it's more than that. It's um, our vision. Um, and we're early days. We just yeah. rolled this out. I don't, it's more than, than the bond sale, but um, uh, just we've only been at this for a couple of weeks, really. Yeah. So we're continuing to grow. We want it to be very organic and responsive um, to the needs of the students first and foremost, and then to teachers and, and to our staff, so. Sure, so, um, <clears throat> so we've kind of created this organizational chart, but it's in a little bit different of a format than you've really ever seen before. Um, you know, for us as we, dream about what this department is going to be really the students are at the core and um, they should be at the core of everything that we're doing um, we feel that encompassing the students with powerful learning experiences and that kind of ties back to some of the work that we've been doing with the Peninsula Promise this year you know trying to develop what what learning should look like for students as we move forward um, and then within that or on top of that encompassing that is teachers staff and administrators and then our department wraps around all of that to support those experiences. And so 
um, the kind of the way we've kind of grouped our teams together now because we are a fairly large department um, moving forward. Uh, we have our curriculum and instruction team. Um, we kind of have an engineering team on the technology side as well as a support team. Um, we also have a clerical group now. Um, in aligning all these groups together, we're already starting to see a lot of overlap that has been happening in the district and a lot of work that has been duplicated or done three or four, five different ways. Um, you know, just in the few weeks that we've been working together. So really, I'm excited about some of the efficiencies we're going to find by moving everybody together here. And so um, we also, as Melissa said, we're bringing, um, bringing in the assessment department as part of this. So Jen and Wa will be joining us as well. Um, this process as well, we have um, decided to move Natalie Boyle from an assistant director to the director of innovative learning. She's going to take on some new roles, especially as we talk about integrating things like computational thinking, digital citizenship, and information literacy into every curriculum area. Um, her background and experience in that and leading the, the instructional staff to do that is going to be in, invaluable for us. And so that kind of is, uh, and then there's Melissa and I, you know, co-leading around the outside trying to uh, keep it all moving forward and heading down the road. And so that's kind of how we, you know, just kind of feel that we're all wrapping around the students, essentially, and that's why we've kind of developed our organizational chart in this manner, so. Mm -hmm. right. So Art talked to us when we uh, first began these discussions and said, what, I want you to dream about what can be. You know, think about what we've done, think about what we have currently, and I want you to dream about what can be. And, and for a superintendent to give you permission to dream and to, uh, to vision into the future, I can say after 30 years as an educator, is an incredibly rare gift. So I am thrilled to be part of this. Um, we, a couple of us, were down at a, at a conference in Portland a few weeks ago, and the, one of the things that really struck me was we have kindergartner, first, and second graders who will live into the 22nd century. So this conversation about preparing kids for the 21st century, we're behind. We're already 20 years behind. So I'm not interested in that, what are we preparing them? It's, it's here, it's now. So what are we doing in the present? And what can we predict will happen? And what are the skill sets and the talents that they are going to need to thrive? Because that's what we want for them, not to, and you heard from Aaron and, um, in our work with Aaron and understanding providing multiple pathways and what are the options for kids and how do we allow kids to follow their passions? What are they interested in? And if it's, if it's not something that we're doing, is there a way that we can get at that so that they're engaged in the work? Because disengaged teachers and disengaged students um, because of a curriculum or a system isn't good for anyone. So um, that's the work that we're really gonna be looking at doing. Um, and really thinking about what are the conditions in order uh, for learning and innovation to thrive. So, an innovation doesn't mean necessarily new, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's got technology um, attached to it. It's something that someone hasn't tried to do before. So, um, opening up as many possibilities as possible, and, and with our teachers really being, rather than developing this is what we're going to do next year, here you go. It's the other, turning it on its head and saying, how are we responsive and, and providing differentiated personal learning experiences in a variety of ways, whether it's PSD Learns once a month or in the classroom or asynchronous um, courses. What does that look like and how does it meet the needs of, of teachers? Um, so really being responsive to their needs, not saying this is your need, this is what we're doing, but tell us what you need and let us support you in that learning. So, and that's what we would expect teachers to be doing with our students. So, um, some of the things that we've done already, um, so what's changed, that the departments have merged and now it's the learning innovation. Um, we have met with all the staff that's been, uh, will be engaged in that work with us. I think we're 27 strong now. Yep. Um, so we kind of, well, I call us the Brady Bunch, right? <laughs> and so kind of this, uh, what does a blended family look like? And all those pieces that go with, how do you take smaller, disparate um, departments and merge them into one big family that are all pulling in the same direction and working in the same vision? Um, and as Chris alluded to, we've really had an opportunity to review 
the unique talents and skill sets of our staff that don't always um, come forward in their job description, but to say, what are you really good at? And, um, and employing that and saying, yes, you're a whatever, but wow, you're amazing at that. How do we harness that talent to support our, again, our kids and our teachers? So things that'll change. Um, again, continuing uh, to seek multiple pathways and multiple options for students and staff. And um, our goal is to be um, in schools more. Not had an opportunity to spend enough time in schools, came from the schools and I miss that. And if we aren't, um, if we aren't there in the trenches, so to speak, seeing the day-to-day -day work, then it's difficult to make an informed decision about what's really happening and what the needs are. So um, we're hoping that this um, group will allow us to spend more time um, talking to teachers. And I'm especially interested in student voice because we haven't had enough of it. So what do students think and what do they want and what are they think, saying? Um, I think the work that we did a couple of years ago with um, Digital Promise. Thank you. Digital Promise. The student voice came out loud and clear, and it was really surprising. So um, we want to go back and, and revisit that that way of um, engaging with kids, too. All right. Questions for us? Any, right. Anything else you wanted to? Uh, no. Um, I think there's just some really great possibilities. I mean, I look at things like data and our assessment and evaluation of data and how having, you know, the typical database administrators and data analysts that I've had on my team mixing with Jen and the assessment teams and being able to, you know, and then mix that together with the teaching and learning staff and being so much closer and together um, will really help us, you know, as we start working down the MTSS route, um, mm -hmm. you know, because that is a very heavily data-driven process and building those tiers of support for all students. And so mm -hmm. the ability for us to really kind of dig in on the data is one thing that's really exciting for me mm -hmm. moving forward. So. Yeah. We've been meeting with John Yellowies on a weekly basis, um, and we're just going to be very much more intentional about the decisions that are made by the department, how and who do they impact, so that we can really think, if I make this decision now to do X, who's going to be impacted by that, and do they know about that, have I had enough conversation with them, and making sure that, um, that the communication is clear and consistent and that we are not siloed. So I think having those larger groups will help us in that. But again, we're, we need to be thoughtful and intentional. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Laurie, do you have any questions? Um, David? Yeah, um, two, two things. One, you talked about finding, you see an overlap and um, redundancies and people doing the same thing. Um, and you want to improve the efficiency of that. And I know when we used to do Six Sigma kind of stuff and do the lane and look for those kind of things. What are you doing to get to those efficiencies? And if you find four people that are all sort of doing the same job, how are you <laughs> resolving that? Yeah. So without you know, eliminating positions. Right, right. So. Yeah, I think that's a challenge. And, you know, we're still, as Melissa said, we're in, you know, very early in this, you know, three or four weeks into this process. And so, you know, there's simple <coughs> tasks that why would everybody, there's a lot to do. There's always a lot to do. There's always plenty of work to do. There's a lot of things that we don't get done um, helping and support the buildings. And so, you know, when there's a clerical task, for instance, that each department is doing, you know, we're putting a burden on the buildings as well because a lot of times it's, you know, call each office manager and get a class list, or, you know, or a building list, or which teachers are teaching. You know, and if every department is doing that, then we're impacting the buildings four mm -hmm. times or six yeah. times or eight times. And, and, you know, trying to eliminate those to put that, to reduce the pressure on the buildings is, you know, mm -hmm. one of those things that we're really trying to work mm -hmm. hard on. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that will free us up for yeah. a lot more. Another good example, I think, is um, last year was the first year we did any kind of in elementary inventory of any curriculum materials. And so um, that was a, a, a shift and a, and a heavy lift. And so in order to expedite that, we've been thinking about how can we go about that? Well, Chris already has someone that does a great job of inventorying. So what's the difference between inventorying a math book as opposed to inventorying a Chromebook? So um, we're going to use that expertise to and build some other systems in the background in place because our, our goal is to not have the systems that we need be out necessarily public, but running very quietly in the background so work just gets done effectively and efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, so 
uh, again. So kids and students have their books the first day of school, or you would get three new kids and you're like, I can't find three Reading Wonders yeah. books. We know they're there, we just yeah. have to be able to put our hands on them quickly um, to support kids and teachers. Yeah, the other thing I would say is I just like the conversation that we're having around the innovation and the pathways. We've been hearing about pathways for a couple of years now. And like I went to a breakfast this morning for CTE. Um, what was it called, Aaron? Breakfast? Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's your end. Yesterday morning. Yesterday morning. Yesterday morning. I'm sorry. It's been, been a long week. Anyway, yes. I went to breakfast yesterday morning yes. and about CT, and there were some students that were talking about the mm -hmm. fact that they were able to identify their pathway. Maybe it wouldn't have been the pathway that she chose versus the pathway yeah. that I chose. And one of the kids said it was sort of life altering for him, you know. So I yes. think it's great that we're giving these students opportunities to find their pathway and not mm -hmm. sort of put, like you said, put them in a stovepipe or whatever and turn out cookie cutter students. So right, like right. Yeah. And you'll see. I'll come back to you again next week with some new classes that we've um, mm -hmm. created, with the idea of that. Um, how do we make um, math or science content accessible to kids who may struggle with reading? So I don't want to keep them from co science content. I want to support them in their reading and math so that they can um, have all the options possible. Yeah. Well, it seemed like it was this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Marcia? Yes. I, I mean, I just love what I just heard. It makes me very, very happy and proud to be a part of the, uh, the district that <laughs> is really taking this, I guess, a new approach for Finistra in addressing um, differentiated in instruction, mm -hmm. the whole child, listening mm -hmm. to the voice of our students. I think um, big things are on the way. Thank you. Leslie? Yes, um, really well done presentation. Um, I'm really excited um, for the follow-up to see what you've learned um, after you've interpreted Sorry. all the data and married it with all this other um, great information. Um, and to see what the outcome is going to look like. I'm really, really excited for the next step. Okay. Thank you. And uh, me as well. Um, I look forward to seeing how the dream evolves and where you're going with it. Um, it's a little cloudy for me right now, but I think um, as it develops, it's going to be fun to see. And, um, my questions right now on it um, is, I know you said you involve the teachers and staff, but I can't imagine all teachers are aware of it. And if you start showing up in the schools all of a sudden, what is, you know, why are you here? What are the goals? Um, so I'm glad you're going to be intentional um, mm -hmm. with what you're doing and making sure it's well communicated prior to just executing on it so that right. teachers feel involved, even parents. Um, you know, mm -hmm. what does it mean to them? What is it, how is this changing their child's experience at school? Right. So thinking about all of that. Right. Well, hopefully um, the culture would be that our teachers would be used to people coming in to see the incredible work that they're doing and it's everything goes on as it should. It's mm -hmm. just one more group of people coming in to see how great we are. And I agree. I, no. just, I yeah. think we need to get there and yes. sometimes you have to be more over communicated yes. during that time. Um, and then I see Jen's name on here. Yes. Um, you're obviously involving her in this. Absolutely. Not back to a new job. She knows. Okay. We have yes. talked to her. Okay. We did talk to her on a day <laughs> immediately after <laughs> surgery. So the next day. So she, she agreed had, to everything? Yeah. Well, yeah, she, pretty much. She, she said, did really well. Yeah. She really yeah, she just said, really please send me an email so I know what you're talking about tomorrow. But, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, she. Yeah, she's. She's excited. She's kind of. You know, it's been a department of two for them for a really long time, and they're really excited to be a part of a yeah, yeah. kind of a bigger team that they can help with. Okay. The, you know, have a little bit more influence in. Thank you, and Art. Thank you for allowing them to go down this path. And do you have uh, any comments on this? I, I would have. I guess, there are many, many places we could go, but let me offer two comments. One of which is the the bigger we get and the more complex we get in the tasks in front of us the more we've tended to divide into our singular silos and, and everybody working as hard as they can possibly work. But dozens of initiatives, dozens of ways, uh, and it does, you touched on it, it be, starts to become overwhelming to teachers and, and kids. And, and uh, so one of the challenges is how do we put this into a concerted effort, a concerted effort of assessment, listening, uh, 
deciding very carefully what our, our directions and efforts are, how, whether they're working or not, and be able to do that in a way that doesn't start with, I guess I'll just say it, fixing teachers. It starts with how do you open up the world of possibilities mm -hmm. and then watch people flourish at, at all levels and can we provide the support. So uh, added to that is my second thought and that's, I, I voiced it to them as they put the initial thoughts together. How can you imagine a world of learning and teaching in the future without thinking of where is the digital world, where is technology, where is what, what that's going to mean and, and what it enables. So to have even those in separate departments as we rolled out uh, one to one, I, and I don't mean that as a criticism, it just means it's an obvious place to pull together and say how do we, how do we take all of this rich staff and really be, be able to uh, create something that's centered around as this graphic would imply uh, powerful learning the, the piece that you also heard John Yellowlees uh, as John is heading up and becoming the face of the multi-tier, that the multi-tier wraps entirely around this learning and teaching in a way that if you think of that as the power for learning in the middle and when you start seeing kids or staff members floating out to the edge, how does that become a designed part of what we want to do? And as we wrestle with uh, what's the proper service for uh, Henderson Bay and, and which kids are we serving and why or online services or and you can keep going down with Aaron and all the, the CTE but that's all part of our same world for kids so how do we do that in a way that's really concerted and go so I am thrilled to to watch people just to, I guess to enable them to take it and go and then uh, see how far we can go in the next 25 years. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Great. And no, I'm not signing on for 25. <laughs> 20? <No. laughs> Talk to Sandy. <laughs> can you believe he said that? OK. Um, we now want to move on to talking about um, some of the upcoming things that we need to work on as a board and then looking at the schedule and how that fits. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Jarvis. And, and the, essentially a, a planning and challenge. Uh, this night, tonight's meeting is a study session. You've seen a really a, a pretty aggressive load of everything from uh, doing business like the cap budget extension and naming uh, the principal number nine capital projects report, an opportunity to put on uh, glasses and, and visit a building. Uh, we are going to be very, very busy. And, and what I need to invite the board to do is, as you look tonight at bond sales and CTE and learning and innovation, is to figure out when and how we get some of the, the work done. But to do that in a way that also brings back the, the conversation we've started, you really started last year and we've, we've touched on a couple times this year, how do we coordinate the, the goals? And as we talked the Peninsula Promise, how do we put that in, in coordination? How does the multi-tier uh, support system be an organized, intentional part of the decision making? As Karen will come to us on the 20th of June with uh, talks about budget and levy uh, planning, we know that our options will be more limited than they probably ever have been, but we're also challenged by a new system of what's enrichment and what enrichment do we want to do. So my request of you is to spend some time fairly soon, and, and in my recommendation to you, it's to take part of our meeting on June 6th. And by the way, earlier I misspoke. I think I referred to June having one meeting. It was like July that has one meeting. Uh, June, we have a meeting on the 6th, we have a meeting on the 20th, and we have a meeting on the 27th. 27th is the regular business meeting. The 20th is reserved at this point, at least tentatively, for uh, building budgets and, and levy planning so that we can get the financial piece. And the 6th is one that's going to look somewhat like tonight in the sense of a number of things we have to touch. but. But I would like to ask uh, for at least an hour of that session and to engage the board in 
uh, looking at the goals, looking at the planning, in a, not really a full-blown strategic planning, but certainly in terms of how do we make sure we're all in the same, uh, the same planet, the same orbits, the, the, the same trajectory. And uh, then in that planning session to also be able to look ahead I mentioned one board meeting in July. Uh, we have one scheduled in August, and we know we need at least two, but that raises the question of whether or not there'll be an opportunity for us to have some kind of a board retreat, board and superintendent, uh, district, and, and so I need to engage you in your busy schedules and try to figure out how to make them even busier, uh, but to do it very intentionally. And uh, so I, I presented, or really Brooke did, uh, the revised board meeting schedule for the, the current, current and next couple months, and then a look, uh, a first draft that, uh, over a next year, which, and that's very incomplete. That's just the beginning to scratch the surface. Certainly the capital projects will be, continue to be insistent, and this fall, and you'll have uh, projects getting ready for final, uh, bid design and calling for bids and launching the projects. But meanwhile, we're going to be doing all of the, what I would consider the, the real, the best work of all, and that's the work of the learning, the work of innovation, the work of our organization, and uh, trying to really make it work for kids in the, in the best possible fashion. So with that, I'm, I'm inviting, a, I guess, an early conversation also permission for the sixth uh, to be able to, to work into a study session and uh, on, the, the board, on the board goals and invite your thoughts on things you want us to put on the table over this next few months that you uh, really are, are, want to stand up and say we have to do this uh, and deal with many, many issues that are in front of you. So with that, it's an invitation to first can I have part of the sixth and engage you in a, in a study session of the board for that purpose? And secondly, to then or now begin the process of looking ahead over a number of months and work out a board calendar. Okay. Um, so to break that up a bit, to look at um, the study session on June 6th, adding in kind of the goals and strategic planning. Um, is everyone fine with that as part of our, of our study mm -hmm. session? Yep. Okay. Yep. And are, what else do you see on that or is this something that you'd like input on? There is, a, you, you got a little glimpse, I don't know whether it registered. Uh, Jeff is ready, will be ready to roll out the, uh, in essence, the, the massing or some something similar to what you saw tonight for the other three buildings. So we have a pretty busy part uh, on June 6th of the, the Capitol. There may be some other issues related to that that are currently trying to take shape. We're working with both uh, Pierce County and uh, City of Gig Harbor on, on some of this. Uh, but there, there's the Capitol side, and then we're also going to try to continue to get as uh, Aaron did this evening, get some of our annual reports uh, in front of you. So it will be a busy evening. Okay. And then um, I know that the last time we did the levy spending plan, and David, you could speak to this better, it was quite involved, but understand that it might be a little different because of the constraints and, and definition of enrichment and all of that. Is that something that we would look at on the 6th, or is that later? Did, did we talk about that being later, Karen? That's the 20th. We're going to be talking about that on the 20th, but we are going to need to, um, later on, we're going to need to get into the 11th. Can I send you the phone? Can you repeat that? Sorry. We're, actually, why don't you come up? We can't hear you. Yeah, we're going to bring Karen to the microphone. Thanks, Karen. For the levy spending plan for 1920, we will bring that to the board on, we'll have discussion about that at the study session on June 20th. 
we're also going to be bringing you pretty much what we're what assumptions we're using for budget development and walk you through some of the, the differences of what things are going to look like um, as far as um, how we're building our budgets for 1920. At the same time, we have to find a, a way to develop a new levy, um, I'll call it an enrichment levy, um, that we need to take to the voters in February of 2020. Um, and so we're going to have to develop some of that probably over the summer months, and then we'll have to build that, um, bring that to you as a part. The challenge that we have is that it's more, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a, a lot of opportunity to add um, based on the limitations of where we are as far as the amount of money that we can collect. And so there will be some challenges with our current levy spending plan. Some of those things will no longer be considered enrichment. Some of those things will be considered enrichment and will and we'll, there will be discussion as to whether or not they, they continue. Mm -hmm. And then there are also things that are over and above the prototypical funding model mm -hmm. that we are going to have to uh, count as enrichment. Um, and so we will have to have discussion about that. So part of the discussion that we have about what's happening with 1920 may drive some of the levy um, build, I'll say, for the future levies, um, for the future enrichment levies. So that work you'll be doing uh, over the su the levy over the summer, and presenting to the board later for, or like early fall. Or yes. When do we have to have yes. that done for February? We need to have it er done early so that we can. Well, so we'll have to bring it to you early September October, okay. so that we can submit it to OSBI and have them approve. And that's not a long process, but we do have to go through that process, and then. Um, we would bring that back to you and you would um, adopt the levy resolution. Okay. And when does that need to be filed, Karen? Is it it's in filed by mid-December? I or? think it's early December. I want to say it's, yeah, I think it's the 13th. And I see that we have okay. a board meeting on the 12th. <laughs> um, okay. But I was thinking we would want to probably adopt our resolution in November. Yeah. Okay. So, that makes sense. So what I, um, when we did the levy spending plan four years ago, there was a levy task force that spent months and months and months um, deciding how to spend the, or what should be in the levy spending plan. Uh, we had several board meetings um, during that time to get updates on the levy spending plan. And I know now it's going to be different. It's going to be a rich enrichment. Um, in fact, we only have one meeting in July. We need to do it. If we adopt the resolution in November, um, we also have to have a public hearing. We're going to have to have some discussion around the enrichment. Um, we're going to have to agree on the enrichment before I think we even send it to OSPI. You're not going to send it to OSPI before we get to see it, right? No. Oh, I know that. Yeah. It's rhetorical. But um, so if you're backing it up, I think that we definitely need to have, start having that conversation sooner than later. And so I don't know if we have an extra meeting in July to discuss just on the enrichment levy, because I think we're going to need some time to just wrap our head around what enrichment means. I agree. And so with the bond, with all the meetings we're having on the bond and to try and stay caught up on the bond. Um, and at the same time, be mindful of the fact we have an enrichment levy in February that's going to be here before we know it. I just think we need to have a meeting in July. But one thing about the July meeting is that for all practical purposes, I mean, I, I hold my all-time record of a seven-minute meeting in July. And, and in this year, we're not going to be able to do that. But the, uh, the jo July is wide open for literally all of that meeting to be able to concentrate on that. What, with our regular meeting. We won't have a lot. I also want to back up just real quickly as I look at Stephanie out there. She's going to be presenting to us on June 6th a uh, little thing like what's the, the theme for school number 10 and the results of the naming committee. So we've got some other work to 
continue. So it's going to be busy, but I think we can, if we can get time on that July meeting and then have an early August meeting around the 8th or so of August, whether that's a retreat or whether that's a study session, however we, we plan it, I think that we can get a long way in that very end of July and the beginning of August. Other topics that we need to be looking at, Leslie? I'm unavailable at the beginning of August. I would have to do it remotely, and my preference would be to have um, it done through Zoom if we need to, because following documents and things like that is um, just very challenging by phone. When will you be back in August? Right. I'd rather have everyone in person, if possible. Oh, hold on a second. I'm on my cell phone. So oh, does that have to be started right this second? No, this is what we can do on the 6th. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you want. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. I know August 8th doesn't work. So. Okay, but Leslie, I'm sorry. We can get that date from you later. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, Lori, any other topics that you're thinking that we need to cover and approximate timing? No. No? Okay. I mean, nothing specific as far as the timing. Okay. Um, the June 6th meeting sounds like it's filling up. Yeah. Um, the other conversation that our board needs to talk about is um, our superintendent position <laughs> um, and, and how we move forward with that. And so I don't know when we would want to do that as a sub study session, but that's something that we would want to put on the agenda. That has to be part would of that be part of the retreat time. discussion? In, in August? Sure. I mean, when, I, I think that works with, I, yeah, I think that works with the well, timing of what we've discussed so far. Yeah. Okay. We're nodding our heads. Hmm. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, we hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy is too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, art. Uh, anything else that you need to get from us for I guess we didn't have any additional dates on here what I would like to invite is over the the next few days be before really our next meeting if possible uh, as I'm planning the sixth let me know of the things that come to your mind that you really want to hear a, a, a report that didn't get made or or something in the future that you'd like to hear more about and, and I'll start organize, try to organize a full year's planning calendar to put in front of you, and, and then we'll put it, fill in the holes that, that, that for things that you really would like to do. So if, if people can help me by letting me know uh, things you would like to hear, reports you would like to mm -hmm. see, discussions you'd like to hold, uh, I can put all of those into a, a planning cal calendar as, as much as humanly possible. Okay. Um, one of the things that we had talked about, and it sort of morphed during the course of the year, and I think I understood that we were going to receive them, but the SIP reports. Um, and I think the board needs to act on those. Is that right, Leslie? Do we need to act on yeah. them? Yeah. It, to actually approve them or accept them. We actually have submitted them. So at this Good point, we, we did them, of course, as reports to me. Uh, I will get them all to you for, for your perusal, uh, but know that we certainly did submit them to the state. Uh, John? Oh. Yeah. It is a, it's a WAC that the school board does approve the SIP plan. Okay. Yeah. So every year it's an annual thing. That would be one thing that should probably be added to the calendar in the future. We can do that. Good. Okay. Or even before the end of this year, just so if the mm -hmm. plan has changed or anything's changed, it's nice to know where things are. Okay. Can I what's on the agenda for next meeting? The twenty third? Next yeah, May twenty third. I actually get them out to us and we can read them and um, so we can finish up the SIP conversation. So, right. 
So just to be clear, so the board did have several SIP presentations, I think four, early on. Um, with everything going on with the bond and whatnot, we decided as a board that the SIP presentations would be challenging to uh, for us to the, as the board to view. Right, right. So we uh, right. actually this is for the uh, the audience and just kind of a recap, Marcia, um, that okay. we will have Dr. Jarvis review the the SIPs and um, then send back to the board and that's where we are right now so right well what what was agreed to was is that the, the schools would report to dr jarvis dr jarvis would then report to us because again it's a whack and that's and it's not necessarily the presentations that we need to approve it's the actual plan yeah and i and i that's what uh the the next course of business is is they'll be sent to the board Take care of it. Good. Okay. And then put your, I mean, that's, that's not like, like reading, so put, put that on the calendar maybe before the end of June to just circle back and touch base with us. If there's any feedback, uh, you can get that to um, Beth or Jarvis. Okay. Pause if you want to handle that, but feedback loop. I'll go over what's on the 23rd. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. This, um, with that, this meeting is adjourned at 8 o'clock. Okay. Thank you.